first part will be about data and indicators for sustainable human development. Uh, this is an outline of presentation and we talk about a number of things. First, what is indicator means? What is the difference between data and indicators? What are the types of indicators? Uh, what are the sources of data? What are the advantages and disadvantages of different data sources? And what are the composite indicators and what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I think uh, that during your group work, all three group faced different constraints with indicators. You would like to measure something, progress of society. But uh, it's very hard for you, you find out that it's very hard to find a uniform rule uh, to measure it, right? So you would like to judge about participation, political participation, but how to judge about it. So we move to this topic. Uh, what is the difference uh, between data and indicators? Um, data uh, shows the status of a given phenomenon. This is one figure. And example of this figure could be a number of uh, sick people, a number of unemployed, number of people who live without sanitation, and so on and so forth. This figure show you the status, but don't tell you the story. Uh, 5,000 sick of influenza, is it uh, a lot or few? Uh, and here we move to indicator. Uh, indicator, that's instrument which shows status and tendency, and typically this is comparison of two things. Uh, so if we talk about data, about number of deaths, indicator will be uh, mortality. What is the proportion of your population died? Uh, if we talk about unemployed people, uh, indicator will be unemployment rate. What proportion of your labor force have no job? Okay? Uh, if we talk about uh, income earned by person, we could talk uh, about indicator of increase or decrease uh, of this income or uh, share of income used for uh, food stuff. Uh, this is thing which I think are uh, well known for many of you. This is our uh, indicators based monitoring chain, right? Who don't know it? Everybody know it? Okay, uh, then I pass it quite quickly. Uh, we have uh, four types of indicators, input, output, outcome, and e impact. Uh, and for each type of uh, indicator we could uh, for each type of uh, thing, we could uh, have an indicator. Uh, and farther we go this chain, the harder we could measure things. And the harder we could influence things. We have virtually full control on inputs. And we have a lot of uh, other factors which uh, affect impact. However, we are interested in measuring all of these stages, right? And one of the problems uh, we will have in uh, HDI is a mixture of input and output outcome uh, things, right? Because in HDI, you have life expectancy, which is outcome, and you have enrollment rate, which is input, and you have literacy rate, which is outcome. So it's kind of mixture. Uh, I think we had an interesting discussion during online module, and it was a tricky question in a uh, multiple choice test about qualitative and quantitative indicators. What kind of indicators you should use? The right answer is that you should use both indicators. And actually, there are two big debates, uh, two big concerns when you come to indicators. One is, do you like to use quantitative or qualitative indicators? The answer is you should use both because uh, what we could measure, this is quantitative indicators, they are not always telling the story and they are based on a number of different assumptions, uh, theories, and so on and so forth. So if we look on unemployment rate, right, which is figure we could relatively easy measure, it based on an assumption that people who are, uh, who are doing subsistent agriculture, they are not employed, they are kind of out of labor force. They are not calculated in labor force, if I'm not mistaken. So, and if you have huge population, uh, you could have very low unemployment rate, but these people sitting in uh, inactive population, right? On the other hand, uh, qualitative uh, things which tell you the story, they are very hard to measure. 
typically. You would like to tell about political participation and how you measure it. Uh, percent of people who vote, but that's not exactly uh, political participation. Uh, you had an example of uh, minority parties' participation of minority in governance, but you rightly pointed out that it doesn't tell you about quality of participation. You have a, uh, in Soviet time, we had a lot of women in government, but was the policy they proposed uh, gender sensitive? That's a very big question for me. Uh, here are a couple of examples of indicators. Ah, and the second uh, debate is, do you like to have one indicator or you would like to have a set of indicators? And typically, people who do research, they tend to have more indicators because they would like to look on the same phenomenon from different angles. Policymakers would like to have one indicator, and that's why they like GDP. And I think it was very famous saying by uh, Roosevelt, who told that I want one hand economists, because these bloody guys always say, on one hand, this is good, on the other hand, it's bad. I want one hand economist. <laughs> so, um, this uh, second debate, if you, have, uh, you, if you would like to have one indicator of many indicators. When you would like to get data, and on the basis of this data, you would like to calculate indicators, you start facing uh, what is the, so uh, the question, what is the source of data? Where from you get these figures? And typically, you have four sources of data. One uh, source is administrative or routine data. You have... Uh, certain system, social protection system, birth registration system, death registration system, uh, and other systems which generate a lot of, lot of data. Uh, second is census data. At certain moment of time, you would like to record everything you have uh, in your country or territory. Uh, that could be people, cattle, houses, or something else. Uh, next is survey data, and I think group uh, second for second, no, it was first group who dealt with uh, subjective uh, happy satisfaction index. You propose that sort of things to survey, to come and survey a small group of people and on the basis of this, do conclusion about society. And fourth source is surveillance data when you monitor a certain group of population for a long time. Uh, each of these sources have uh, strengths and limitations and we will discuss it now. Administrative data. Uh, they're generated as a byproduct of uh, certain events or processes. When a person comes to unemployment uh, labor force office, he, registered, he or she registered in database, and somewhere automatically you get data about number of people applied for uh, unemployment benefit, number of people who are registered unemployed, and so on and so forth. When a person gets pension, he or she automatically registered in database, and you could look what is the average value of pension, and so on and so forth. Um, if a person uh, dies, it, this fact is registered in certain system, and uh, you have data about mortality. Uh, however, these uh, data are generated as a byproduct, and primary purpose of uh, this system is typically management. Uh, so you should know number of pensioners to know how much money you will pay next month. Uh, you should uh, uh, know how many unemployed uh, you have to plan your training program and so on and so forth. Uh, data production is triggered by event. And this is a very important point because if you don't have this event, uh, you have no data. And uh, these examples, we are coming to advantages and disadvantages. Um, if you don't have this event, uh, you have no data. And here are advantages of administrative sources. Uh, they are less expensive, and as they are byproduct of the system, uh, cost of uh, getting this data is quite marginal. Uh, system works and generates data nearly automatically, and you get this data. Uh, these data are very useful for short-term and medium-term purposes, and uh, if you dealt with policymaking, you know that uh, people typically ask how many people we have, how, what is the average uh, pension size, things we easily get from administrative sources and don't wait uh, for survey data and so forth. Um, 
And another point that this administrative data is very good for small areas disaggregated data. Um, typically, many of these registries are maintained on local level. Uh, and if we are talking about service, they typically, uh, you, you, sh you should have very huge number of observations to have representative data on very low level, on level of community. Uh, but these administrative sources typically have a full coverage of community. And that's uh, why they're quite useful. And uh, I think it was in your reading materials, a uh, paper book from Poland, which called Indicator-Based Approach to Social Exclusion. And what they did, they, uh, they reconcile data from administrative sources with data coming from survey. And they managed to get relatively good estimations of poverty and unemployment on level of Gmina, which is uh, below, uh, well, it's basically town or uh, village. Disadvantages. Uh, these systems are typically very expensive to set up, uh, and uh, you should spend a lot of money and time to get the system run. Uh, and as this is uh, not primary purpose of uh, as data production is not primary purpose of this system, uh, that could be very hard to argue that you should set up the system to get this data. Uh, very problematic thing is uh, event-based registration because this event could be very biased. And I could provide two examples. Uh, in uh, post-Soviet countries, in post-USSR uh, countries, um, Registered unemployment rate are typically much, much lower than real unemployment rate obtained through labor force survey. And in Balkan countries, uh, registered unemployment rate typically are much higher than uh, real unemployment rate you get from a labor force survey. The question is why? Do somebody have an answer? No. Answer is a structure of in incentives. In, in uh, Post-USSR countries, level of benefits you get from uh, re being registered unemployed is very low. And you have no incentive to being registered. So you kept in database for a couple of months. You probably will not get benefit because there are a lot of conditions how you could get benefit. And there is, there is no why should I register in this database. At Balkans, everybody registered in unemployment uh, service get free of charge medical insurance. And it's huge incentives to be registered because it saves you a lot of money to access health system. And that's why they have higher rates of uh, registered unemployment than real unemployment. And if you start using this data for policymaking purposes, you will be in a problematic situation if you see that you have 30% of unemployment, while in reality, this is 10% and it's completely different people who are registered in the system and who are really have no job, okay? So that thing uh, is a huge disadvantage of uh, administrative data source. Mm -hmm. uh, one example of uh, very problematic data quality is uh, in one caucus country, they had a uh, discrepancy between real registration of death and birth and uh, registered in system of 30%. So they didn't register 30% of deaths and births at, at certain moment of time. That's very problematic uh, data. When we are coming to data related to finances, typically Ministry of Finance quite closely monitor these things because it relates to funds allocation, so on and so forth. So uh, data about uh, enrollment, data about uh, health uh, are more or less uh, okay. Uh, of course, there are a lot of incentives for school directors to inflate number of students because they get more money. And uh, let's go to uh, incentives and events registration. Uh, I, I pr show you an uh, example from uh, unemployment service, which is incentive for people to register or not register, but it could be incentive for system uh, itself to register or not register events. Uh, for instance, crime rate. People are not in, uh, interested to register crimes because that means they should investigate and do something about it. That's why registered crime rates could be much, much lower than uh, a real crime rate. Okay? So quality, again, uh, quality could vary very significant. Uh, 
and it depends on ability of system to monitor their stuff. Uh, censuses. Uh, censuses is one time snapshot of whole society and it collects data from every unit of generally speaking population. Theoretically it should have 100% uh, percent coverage and cover everybody. Uh, it's very expensive because you should come to all units and it's very time consuming not only in terms of data collection but in terms of data processing. Uh, because you get a, a lot of data which you should process somehow. Uh, population census. Uh, typically it uh, comes to everybody member of population, collect basic data. Uh, in some cases it could be attached additional models. Um, and normally it's one in ten years. And it's, uh, census is typically very important to get uh, this data because mid, uh, between censuses uh, different, uh, different estimations are based on census years. For instance, number of population between censuses is, is based on census data plus adjustment for mortality, for, de uh, for uh, births, and certain adjustment for migration, but it's based on uh, census. And if uh, you have huge unobserved uh, changes in population uh, between censuses, uh, you could get very, very uh, biased estimates. Uh, census data, as census data provide uh, data on all levels of society, so you could get uh, on very s small uh, areas, uh, you could get census data on very small areas, they are very good to uh, do certain small area estimates and things like that. Uh, that's I told you. Uh, there is huge, uh, as I told, there is huge uh, lag between data uh, collected and published. Typically, uh, data on population census are published during two years after uh, census itself. And typically, um, and statistical office publish first certain part of figures and then they go with more detailed figures. Uh, Yes, uh, and also uh, there are two disadvantages here. Uh, one, it's uh, in some cases it could not cover a special group of uh, population. For instance, nomadic groups and homeless people um, who are, have no, because when census occurs, uh, people should go to certain addresses where people live. And you, if you have no address, how could I reach you? Uh, second, uh, as censuses are implemented by national, uh, in most cases implemented by national state offices, which are government controlled, uh, you could see very huge inten intentions to bias certain figures. So in, not in all cases you could trust sensitive figures. Uh, one example is Bosnia and Herzegovina who did no census for many, many years simply because they're afraid to get real picture of uh, proportion of population who are uh, Bosniaks, who are uh, Serbs, and so forth, because it could have very significant political uh, implications. Uh, next, uh, I saw data on Moldovan uh, population census data about ethnicity. and. I cannot say they are forged, but they are very, very close to statement of political parties who claim that we do, don't have Romanians in country. It's only 2% uh, of people who identify themselves as Romanians and uh, the rest are Moldovans. And uh, we got the same figures from the census. And for me, it's very suspicious. Okay. Uh, establishment census, uh, they are, you could, uh, make a roster of not only people but different things like hospitals, businesses, uh, production cooperatives and so on and so forth. Um, that's very useful uh, if you would like uh, to create a framework for uh, other surveys. And population census is also used as a frame, assembling framework for further surveys. Um, and here we come into sample survey data. Uh, Sample survey is based on idea that you could survey 
small part of your population, something like 1-2% of your population, but if you select these people correctly, you could, make, uh, you could make conclusions for the whole society. And uh, typically, sample survey are much more cheaper than census and provide relatively reliable data. Uh, there are two preconditions. Uh, first, you should, you should do it properly. You should have good sample frame. And second, uh, you should think about uh, groups of population you would like to include. Uh, sampling frame is first problem uh, because uh, in far too many cases you don't have uh, addresses. Uh, for instance, when Moldova uh, household budget survey was introduced, they based on electoral lists. And they find out huge discrepancies between information which is in list and real situation at this address. Uh, in 2006, they shifted on new sample, which is based on population census and uh, quality of data increased radically. Second, you should think where you collect data. You collect data in a limited number of points, but for huge number of people, or you collect uh, data in many, many points, but fewer number of people. Uh, typically, you should try to collect uh, data in more points to get to avoid cluster effects. Because if you go, uh, for instance, if I do survey on Vatsi Utka, uh, Utsa uh, about something, you, I get very, very specific group of population who is hanging around there. And if I go to Keleti uh, uh, train station, I will get completely another group of people. And if I uh, survey only two groups of, these two groups of people, uh, I could come to very wrong conclusion who are living in Budapest, okay? So you should try to avoid cluster effect and cover uh, population more. Uh, uh, about inclusion, uh, as these samples are probability, in most cases probability-based, there is a very few probability to include small groups like, uh, and here we come to minorities. If you have only 1% of population who belong to this minority, there is a very small probability to, for this person to get in sample. And typically, uh, sample, survey, uh, sample design include specific subcomponent, which, which call boosters, and it go to directly to these people and inflate a uh, share of these people in total number of observations. Okay. Uh, uh, advantages. Uh, low cost, collect different, collect wide range of uh, information, uh, relatively reliable. You should pay attention how you formulate questions uh, because uh, you could ask the same thing in a very different way, and you could get very different answers. Uh, also, design of survey in terms of interviewers is very important. Uh, I think yesterday I provided you an example of um, women interviewers going to Albanian uh, families, because uh, simply because of cultural reasons, they cannot speak, speak with men. Uh, but this is very true for other specific groups, for instance, Roma, who uh, in survey of Roma in Moldova, we used Roma interviewers in Roma communities because it is uh, more trust to Roma. Roma. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it provides you uh, with quite quick data, so uh, you could get data from survey quite quickly. Uh, it's not two years like in uh, census. Depends on size of survey, it could be from one month to three month uh, delay. Uh, here we have some examples of uh, household surveys, which is uh, multi indicator cluster survey, demographic and health survey, living standard management survey, uh, household budget survey, household income and expenditure survey. They use different methodologies and different questionnaires for data collection and focus on different, uh, different uh, things. Uh, for instance, household income and expenditure survey, they focus more on uh, getting reliable estimates of uh, expenditure incomes. 
and don't take into account some other things. Uh, and it's very important uh, when you work with survey data to see what was the primary idea of this uh, survey and how they collect data. Uh, for instance, when we worked with Macedonia uh, people-centered analysis, uh, we find that estimations of incomes and expenditures of households were very, very, very problematic. But that was not the purpose of the survey. We didn't, it was one simple question, in average, how much money you get during, during last month. And, okay, 2,000, 3,000, uh, maybe 5,000. Uh, but uh, in the Department of Statistics in Macedonia, they run household budget survey, which provides with very, very reliable estimates uh, of incomes and expenditures because they're based on questionnaire, they're based on recall questionnaire for big expenditures, and so on and so forth. So you should keep in mind what was the design survey and how it was conducted when you look on data. Otherwise, you could come to very uh, different conclusions. Uh, demographic surveillance system. Uh, this is a system when you uh, select group of population and follow it during years. Um, it has a very huge advantage that you uh, supervise this uh, group of population during. Uh, you cover whole this population and you get uh, panel data. Uh, it's very expensive to maintain. So. This table compare data sources. Uh, we discussed about these data sources, uh, about inclusion, coverage, bias. Okay, so uh, you will you will have these uh, slides in your presentations. So future, in future you could uh, look, but you see that all uh, all uh, these sources have its own advantages and disadvantages, and there is no best source of data. For each situation, you have best uh, source of data which you could use in this particular case. But you should also look on other data sources and uh, see what you could get from there. What, what we could do if uh, data is not there? So we simply don't have a registry of political participation. We simply don't have poverty data because nobody uh, can run survey in this country and get reliable uh, income estimates. When you uh, have uh, no data, you could use proxy data. Proxy is uh, something indirectly measuring a uh, thing we would like to know about. Yeah? So if we would like to know uh, what is the poverty level in our country, but we don't have uh, incomes and expenditures, we could look on uh, other things, for instance, do we have a lot of uh, markets where people sell second-hand goods? Uh, do we have a lot of uh, do we have a lot of applications to uh, local offices for uh, one-time benefit and so on and so forth? Uh, these uh, these proxy indicators are very hard to compare between countries, and they are very highly linked with your context. Uh, and be, uh, they are very highly linked with uh, situation in your country and cultural and economic and social things. So it's not easy to translate one proxy indicator from one country to another, and it's uh, very hard to compare them. Uh, here are a couple of examples of proxy of poverty indicators. Uh, food share of household expenditures. Uh, in sometimes you have very hard time to negotiate about uh, poverty line. Uh, some academics could say, no, we should base all our poverty line on subsistence minimum methodology. Some others say, no, it should be another approach, so on and so forth. But you could judge about food share in household expenditures uh, because higher uh, the share of uh, food consumption, lower incomes. Uh, level of outstanding payments per household. So do you have debts for uh, your apartment? If you have debts for your apartment, that's an indicator of a problem. Uh, eligibility of bank loans. Uh, do we have a lot of uh, rejections for uh, ba bank loans uh, in this community or no? Uh, usage of dental services because this is not a primary health thing. Uh, 
uh, you could wait. Uh, of course, most of you could say, ah, by the way, this is wrong thing. This is not completely how we measure poverty. And that's very right, because this is proxy. And you should use this proxy very carefully, because it has a lot of much, much more assumptions in it than simply poverty line, poverty measure. Okay? But they are useful if you, are, if you would like to get more or less comprehensive picture of your community, of your country. Uh, th that was quantitative uh, proxies, but you could also use qualitative proxies, uh, and I think it's very closely related with your happiness uh, subjective approach. Uh, can you afford to buy uh, meat or fish twice a week? Uh, do you have two pairs of uh, shoes? So on and so forth. Do, can you afford uh, vacancy outside of town if you wish? Uh, one, one very important uh, thing is metadata. Uh, because when we start looking at data, as we passed all this presentation, uh, first question you could answer, how, how the hell did you get this data? Where is it coming from? Is it administrative data source or survey? How you define poverty line? Because uh, I could uh, compare poverty line of 20, uh, something like 17, 20% in Bulgaria, I think, and 50% in Tajikistan, but what is this poverty line? And uh, when I start looking on data, I find out that Bulgaria use relative poverty line, which fluctuates in around 20%, but it's, uh, in most cases it cannot be very high. But Tajikistan could use uh, unmet basic needs or $1 per day, and it's absolute poverty, it's different things. So you should describe what are these data, what are the assumptions, how it's coming uh, from, and I think it's, Many, many statistical offices in our countries now conducting work to do uh, this uh, metadata. IMF have special, two special programs, one called General Data Dissemination uh, Standard and one called Special Data Dissemination uh, Standard, which push for metadata and push for making data available. They have certain limited set of economic indicators and countries who subscribe to these uh, standards, they have to publish on their websites regularly uh, this information and metadata, how they collect and with whom you could consult about it. Uh, and um, this is very important thing and uh, it's important two aspects. First, if you do research, you should look on metadata and find out who did this survey, how they did, what they asked, uh, so, so forth, and that give you a clue about potential uh, problems with quality of data and potential bias. That's coming to your question about quality of data. Uh, where is data coming from? What is the potential bias? Who registered it? Uh, okay. uh, second, when you do survey or do some field work, you should describe it because in many cases, I face the data, face the databases where I have very strange figures, and I simply can't understand how you get this figure in this database. And when I start looking uh, on how they do it, uh, I find out that they based on very wrong assumptions, very wrong questionnaires, and so on and so forth. But if you simply pull this figure out of uh, blue and put in your research, it will be a problem. Uh, here we're coming to use and abuse of indicators. Uh, one could be wrong indicator. And uh, I remember one wonderful story from one country where uh, president find out that during uh, five years of his term, poverty did not increase, but he make a promise to decrease poverty. And he forbidden to publish absolute poverty data and ordered to start publishing relative poverty data. And Overnight, he get decrease of poverty from 50% to 20%. That's, that's a very good indicator of wrong, uh, very good example of wrong indicator. Uh, because you're looking on wrong thing. But uh, that could be another, that's, that's very kind of extreme uh, example of uh, politically motivated use of wrong indicators. But uh, that could be, uh, that could be other, unintentional uh, use of wrong indicators. For instance, if you analyze employment in your country, uh, you could base on, other, uh, on different things. 
And one source which is typically available in our countries is uh, number of employed. But this, uh, this is a legacy of Soviet statistical system, and it's typically coming from a uh, survey of enterprises who have 20 or more employees. And if you have significant restructuring of your economy with a lot of small and medium enterprises, up to 10 people appearing, you have a lot of people who are out of this survey system. And you could have a wrong conclusion that your labor force is declining, but it's not declining, it's shifting to other form of employment. So you should uh, think what is indicator. Uh, Next could be wrong interpretation. Uh, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it big? Is it small? And so on and so forth. Uh, unlike scales, it's also very, uh, very often uh, when we compare, especially between countries. So scales could be very different. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and here we come into uh, composite indicators. Uh, and I think we discussed it a uh, little bit today. What are the composite indicators? Uh, first of all, composite indicators is a kind of attempt to satisfy this policymaker with one hand economist uh, and compress a lot of inter information in one figure. Uh, so it aggregates information from different areas. And very often these data are incomparable directly. For instance, when you push together uh, life expectancy and literacy in human development index, uh, it's very hard to argue that it's comparable things and you could uh, put them together. But it could work uh, because it aggregates huge amount of information in one figure. Uh, next is indexing absolute values. Uh, when you calculate human development index, you not, don't use uh, absolute values, you rescale them. So uh, human development index is on scale from zero to one, right? And it components uh, life expectancy index, education index, and GDP index, they also on scale from zero to one. And when you have uh, absolute value of life expectancy, you simply rescale it uh, on scale, right? Is it clear? No. no. Okay. Uh, but uh, you have, uh, in design of composite indexes, you have an issues of choice. You should choose uh, some approaches. Uh, one is how you aggregate uh, individual components. So in this case, in case of uh, group uh, two, you had four components. Uh, how you aggregate them? What, what are the components, how you aggregate them? Uh, second question is, what are the weights of different components? You propose that all four components have the same weight, but that could be not true. People could more value economic uh, development rather than political, or they could more value uh, good environment rather than economic development. So that could be a question of weights. Human Development Index use the same weight for uh, three areas, but inside of education area, uh, life expectancy have a weight of two thirds and uh, enrollment rate have a, a weight of one third. So you could re-weight re uh, components of, uh, in each area and you could re-weight areas. But you should, uh, you should provide good explanation why you weight it how you weight it. There are different, uh, for instance, Ukraine, they uh, have very comprehensive index of uh, uh, territorial development. They, uh, they des disaggregated human development index on territorial level. And uh, they use uh, specific statistical analysis to weight these areas. Uh, next question, how, because you rescale uh, absolute values, how you choose minimum and maximum value. Why in human development index life expectancy minimum is 25 years and maximum is 85? Uh, how, how you select this minimum and maximum values? Uh, when uh, human development index was created, they did a kind of research and find out that in foreseen future, it's very doubtful that we will have life expectancy more than 85 years. And if you have a life expectancy less than 
25 years, it's very hard to talk about development because people just survive and die. So it's a very huge question how you solve this. Uh, problems with composite indexes. Uh, as you see, we always talk about advantages and problems because it's not black and white picture. Uh, it's a more complex picture, and you should know about this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, criticism is that composite indexes bring together apples and oranges. Political and environment, oh, how, how you could glue them together. Huh? Uh, second, uh, how you choose minimum and maximum. Why 25, why 85? Uh, huge question is analytical interpretation. Uh, okay, what HDI value means? What is physical value of this uh, HDI? Mm. This country have far away stun, have HDI of 0 0.7. What it mean? How you could interpret? You could interpret GDP per capita uh, in more or less physical way. It's kind of what total wealth of country, okay. Uh, you could interpret uh, life expectancy, but composite indexes is very hard to interpret. Uh, second, what does a rank mean? <coughs> what you ranked all countries, and your country is on 75th place. What this rank mean? And uh, this ranking is very, very politically important because first thing uh, country management do, they look in this report and say, ah, we are in position 75, but our neighbors on position 76, ha <laughs> we perform better than they. And if they find out that their uh, neighbors are on position 65, they say, oh, why? So this question about ranking and especially changes in ranking is very important because you could change rank of your country without change of value. If your uh, neighbors outperform you, you're going down. And if uh, they uh, fail, you go up. So what does this rank mean? Uh, and uh, this creates ambiguity for policymaker. Uh, one very important, uh, uh, one very important uh, ambiguity in policy making that HDI don't penalize for imbalanced development. So you could have uh, education index of 0 0.5, uh, life expectancy index of 0 0.4, and uh, GDP index of one. You could be very rich but uneducated and unhealthy country. Uh, and you have very good value of uh, HDI. For me, it's very interesting. I continue to favor composite indices, but I agree that we have to do quantitative and qualitative data, but how can we do that? So I would like to think more about it because it's really important. Let's say what we were thinking there, corruption, we want to add that dimension. So we were thinking maybe we should put number of uh, political officials or something uh, brought to court but then it doesn't mean that if we have more of them brought to court, maybe we have a better legislative system or court system. It means that we have higher corruption levels. So maybe we have to leverage that and have a corruption perception survey but, it, and look at them together. But can we do it still in an index? I mean, how? Well, uh, what is being done? Okay. Starting point should be the question, why you do this composite indicator? Except this fancy exercise in CU course, why you do this uh, composite index? You would like to do it for cross-country comparison. You would like to do it for monitoring of uh, things in your country. Why you do it? And uh, that brings part of answer to your question. If you would like to do cross-country comparison, you should find out a certain indicator or data which are cross-country compar comparable. Uh, for instance, uh, I so very interesting slide in um, Kaufman presentation. You know Kaufman, this guy in the World Bank who push uh, this uh, global governance things. And he had a slide about illegal corruption and legal corruption in different countries. So they had a survey of companies and they asked, did you pay bribe? So you've, that's illegal. You pay money for doing something which is prohibited, but you pay. Yeah, then you get it. And second, they asked the question, did you use legal corruption? So you pay to advocacy firm, uh, to some kind of lobby company, which 
invite politician to dinner, and somehow they push this thing. And they find out that, uh, for instance, in uh, post-Soviet countries, there is a lot of illegal corruption. Firms pay to officials to get the decision done. And there is a limited uh, official corruption, legal corruption, because it's, there is no legacy, there is no history of this. But in the United States, there is very few, few uh, illegal corruptions, but huge legal corruption. Because it's whole history, this whole culture of these lobby companies who push uh, ideas. So, uh, and if you start measuring by this small element, uh, you will get non-comparable picture. But if you focus on your country, you could find things which tell you about this. That's nice. Uh, uh, I wanted to pay attention to uh, quantitative and quali um, qualitative data, yes. And I wanted to say that qualitative data should be quantified. And the question is, uh, is it like this? Should it be uh, quantified? And in what way? Uh, yes, it should be. And uh, it's always you try to quantify quantify qualitative data and qualify qu uh, quantitative data. So when you have, uh, you, you could start with the general question, uh, are you happy? But you could come with scale. I'm completely unhappy or I'm completely happy. Uh, you could measure subjective poverty by asking different questions. Uh, can you afford this or that? So yes, you should quantify uh, qualitative data, but don't forget about uh, qualifying quantitative data. You should give explanation. 50% poverty, is it a lot or it's small? And for this, you should have a kind of context indicators. In this sense, you could find interesting approach of uh, European Commission, European Union, in dealing with social inclusion indicators, because they have to compare all this bunch of very different countries uh, of European Union and on very different aspects. And they come out with a number of uh, indicators. One is mandatory indicators for all countries. Country report on the same indicators collected according to the same methodology. It's a kind of one yardstick. You could measure different countries and compare Hungary with Bulgaria, with Slovakia, and so on and so forth. Another is a, a set of indicators country developed for themselves. It's more for themselves. It's more for Poland to judge how we are performing in the labor market rather than compare Poland with Hungary. And third set is a general context indicators, and it's completely qualitative. It's explaining things, how it happens, in what environment it happens. And this could come out with these uh, incentives or disincentives to understand increase or decrease in certain figures, like I told about uh, registered unemployed at Balkans. So yes, my answer is you should try to quantify it. If qualitative data, qualitative data should be quantified, then if, uh, Mikhail, you say yes, then I completely disagree with you. Cause, okay, uh, why? Uh, because uh, that's not how you work with qualitative data. There are certain ways to deal with quantitative data. There are certain ways to deal with qualitative data. And the way you analyze qualitative data, and that's why you actually collect qualitative data and not quantitative data, is that you code and you look for patterns or themes in, within qualitative data. These are just two different approaches. So uh, um, you can have and work with both quantitative and qualitative data in one project. But again, qualitative data are not for quanti quantified purposes, so to say. And that's a very complicated question. And generally, you know, uh, in, graduate in graduate school, uh, people take classes on quantitative data, like a semester long, and then take classes on qualitative data. And that, uh, so it's kind of, I mean, you know, it'll take forever probably to respond. But again, uh, I just totally disagree that qualitative data has to be quantified. And you probably, because, you know, um, I know you are kind of in research methods as well. So I know maybe if you want to kind of comment. I am very happy with our group because we have a 
quite interesting mixture of people who uh, have quite different backgrounds, and that's why they are coming with completely with different ideas. And uh, I think it's very good because we could look on the same problem from different angles. But coming to your uh, question, wasn't it you who ha half an hour, an hour <laughs> ago <laughs> proposed to quantify subjective things? And I completely agree that uh, approach to codify, <laughs> no, one is approach to codify qualitative data and look on patterns. That's very valid approach, but in far too many cases, we would like to quantify qualitative data, and subjective things are exactly this. No, oh. that's a great issue. That's exactly what it is. Uh, this issue of measuring corruption, it is not just corruption. There is a wide range of uh, uh, less tangible or more difficult to grasp issues, and I think it's important to uh, go how we go about this. So first step, we need to uh, defragment the phenomenon. So. Talking about corruption is something very general. So we need to define the specific areas. What do we mean by corruption? What are its uh, uh, manifestations? It can be a bribe, it can be present, whatever, in inviting somebody for a cruise with a yacht. Or so there's a number of things. And depending on the individual phenomenon, individual fragment of this, then we will uh, uh, be able much easier to adjust and to uh, support propose some kind of measurement and data source which is relevant to the phenomenon. Otherwise, it, would, it gets totally lost. Of course, the easiest way is to go and ask qualitative. <laughs> Are you experiencing corruption and quantify yes or no and to what extent? But I think it's very unreliable because unless we exactly define what do we people mean by corruption, then we may have totally different uh, uh, views. And in fact, we think that they are talking about the same thing, but maybe actually they are not. And also, the cultural aspect is extremely important here, because in different cultural contexts, uh, what some countries can perceive as corruption is simply perceived as a manifestation of uh, kind of friendly attitude or respect or whatever. So I think it also can be weighted for this. The simple thing is, uh, uh, if we go, for example, for uh, this facilitation of the process, oiling the cogwheels, simply measure the administrative procedure. Then you can have a proxy, which is, for example, time necessary to do this or that, and register this time very easily, just going send students to register a company or send students to cross a border back and forth and measure the time and register the, the necessary steps and so on. And then you can follow this by year. Well, how does it change? Do the regu regulations which needs to be re uh, somehow passed or respected increase or decrease? Does the time decrease or increase? And then you have a quantitative measure of something which is rather qualitative aspect. 